Hi, everyone. We are here for the annual meeting of the executive order number four, uh, the Interagency Committee on Green Procurement and Agency Sustainability. Uh, we are joined on the committee. I'll let everybody introduce themselves. My name is Darren DeRocha. I'm the commissioner's designee from OGS. I'm Beth Meir. I'm our commissioner's designee from the Department of Environmental Conservation. And Darren and I are the co-chairs of the committee. Heather Saunders. I am NYSERDA's designee for our president and CEO, Alicia Barton. Brian Hahn. I'm the designee from our president, Sabrina M.T., from Environmental Facilities Corporation. Sandra Pierre, Jean, Division of the Budget. Mary Jane King, um, New York Power Authority's de designee, uh, President Gil Kenyonis. Thanks very much. Uh, so the first thing on the agenda is a little introductory remarks, and uh, I'll let Beth go ahead with that. Um, I'm just saying I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, is that mic working okay, gentlemen? I don't, yeah, great. A little closer. Oh, okay. We've got a lot of great progress to report, I'm happy to say, and there's also a lot of really great work go underway. Um, a lot of us have been working hard in the last few months together a lot. Um, I want to thank all the members of the committee for being here today and the work that so many of you have put in on the guide and the report and all the specifications that we've been doing. Um, and also uh, just everything we've done on green contracts, so, you know, recognizing everyone who's working on the Green Procurement Subcommittee for all that work. So thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. All right, great. So next on the agenda is an opportunity for public comment, and I'd just like to say to anyone in the audience, uh, if you'd like to uh, step forward and uh, I don't know if we need a microphone or if you'd like, you can come right up here, speak into this mic if you'd like to make public comment. Podium that, too. What's that? Oh, or up at the podium, thank you. And you can have your comments recorded. Um, the way we're gonna do this is uh, when we get into the part of the agenda that we introduce or discuss uh, green specifications, if you have a particular comment on that particular specification, we will recognize you and you can comment at that time. But if you wanna make general public comment, uh, this is your opportunity. So would anybody like to uh, go to the podium and make any comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move into the next part of the agenda, which are subcommittee reports. And again, uh, Folks, when you come up to make your report, if you want to go either to the podium or to the microphone at this table, either one is fine. The Operations and Engagement Subcommittee is first, and that's Brendan Woodruff of DEC. Wouldn't be an update for me if we didn't have a bunch of props here for it as well. Um, <laughs> So I want to say um, thanks to everybody who's been involved with the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee this year. We've had a fantastic year. I think it's our best one yet. A um, couple overall comments is we've spent a lot of time this year uh, capacity building, so working with uh, the coordinators of the different agencies, working with their teams to try and build internal capacity to be able to carry out more projects in the future. That's been our main focus, and that's going to allow us to do a lot more going forward. And overall, we've had a lot more engagement at every single level, whether it's having a basic phone call, holding a webinar, having meetings, working on uh, projects. We've had a lot more engagement from uh, various agencies, including some that we haven't had a lot from before. So it's been a really banner year. A couple highlights um, from the, the previous year here. We held our third annual Green New York Forum in October of 2018. So that's the third year in a row that we've gathered all of the state agency coordinators. Um, in addition, we held our first action challenge coming out of the uh, forum. We had, uh, at the time, Deputy Secretary for the Environment, Venetia Lannan, issued a challenge to all agencies to take an action, no matter how large or small, um, to improve the sustainability of their agency. A couple 
Overall, we had 52 actions taken at 31 different entities that came out of that. A couple highlights from that. Uh, the Battery Park City Authority created a zero waste committee that's working on a zero waste plan for their offices at the facilities there. Uh, DEC launched the first community solar procurement of any New York State governmental entity coming out of that. The Department of Labor instituted a new records retention policy for purchasing that's saving on average 6,500 pieces of paper a year, and that's something that's replicable to other agencies, so we're going to be sharing that as well. Uh, Department of Public Service and NYSERDA are deploying rechargeable battery programs in their offices to reduce battery waste. Hudson River Black River Regulating District is putting reusable dishware in all of their break rooms for staff to use, reducing single-use waste. And even though some of these projects seem small, uh, once you start adding that up across all the different agencies and sharing what they're doing, uh, it's going to have a pretty large impact. And in addition, uh, two more noteworthy examples, the New York State Bridge Authority eliminated all plastic stirrers and straws from their offices as a first step towards eliminating all single-use plastics from their operations. And um, the NFTA out in Buffalo increased the amount of recycling bins at their uh, bus station by 200%. In addition, over the last year, we had the largest Green Year Commute Day ever. We had 2,300 staff that offset 22.1 tons of carbon emissions. We launched our sustainability series of webinars, which we have our flyer here for. We've just announced the next six months. Uh, this is a program where once a month we have a webinar during lunchtime where state employees can learn how to be more sustainable in their own lives. Topics have included everything from how to green your commute to reducing single-use plastics, home composting, energy efficiency, and we'll keep that program program rolling as well. Uh, we're providing one-on-one -on -one assistance in meetings with agencies. Uh, we're working on a new waste audit project where we have uh, facilities across state government conducting waste audits. We're going to then compile the data from that, see what some trends are and how we can work on reducing our waste based on that. We've updated the Green New York website again, focusing on a lot of tip sheets. You can see another one here that we worked on, and I'd just like to give a big shout out to the OGS communications team with uh, Jen Warner and Jeff Knack, who do an absolutely phenomenal job for us, both with the website and putting together uh, these fact sheets. So we've got a lot more of those coming. And I think the most important thing we've done is we've really empowered our coordinators to take actions at their agencies uh, by consistently communicating with them, uh, getting the word out, and most importantly, supporting them. Over the course of the next year, we're looking forward to providing more training for coordinators. We're going to continue to build capacity with a focus on building those core teams within the different agencies, and uh, we'll continue to focus on simple and cost-effective actions that agencies and coordinators can take. And I'd be remiss if I did not put in a plug for this year's uh, Green Your Commute Day event. It's coming up on Friday, May 17th. We encourage everybody, not just state employees, to uh, green their commute on that day. So whether you're gonna walk, bike, uh, carpool, take transit, look into electric vehicles, um, get out there and let's reduce our carbon emissions that day. So thanks a lot. Thank you, thanks Brandon. very much, Brandon. Uh, the next report is of the reporting committee, subcommittee, excuse me, and that's Shireen Brock from DEC. Hi everyone, I'm Shreen Brock. I am the EO4 Reporting Subcommittee Chair. And um, just, just to give a brief overview, EO4 directs state agencies and authorities to incorporate sustainability into all aspects of their operations. To accomplish this, agencies are required to submit an annual sustainability report, assign an, an employee to serve as sustainability coordinator, and implement a sustainability program at their agency. This year, a record number of agencies completed the reporting form. Areas of focus on the reporting form include measuring waste generation, recycling, waste prevention and reuse, reducing toxic chemicals, conserving energy and switching to renewable energy sources, greening transportation, conserving water, and protecting natural resources. <laughs> We are working hard to streamline the executive order reporting process for state agencies this year. Our editing meetings began in February, and these meetings will continue until June. The, the reporting form will be finalized and sent to agencies by July 15th with a completion date of October 18th this year. The reporting subcommittee consists of a collaborative team of people that are dedicated to making sure that the reporting process goes as smoothly as possible. 
Each year we work to edit the reporting form to ensure that we are asking the right questions to gather the data needed. This team of people also follows up with agencies that do not report by the deadline and calls agencies when sustainability coordinators leave their positions so that we have a contact at the agency to send the report to. I just want to thank the entire subcommittee for their ongoing efforts. The reporting form would not be possible without the team of people that we have working on it. All right, great. Thanks very much, Shireen. Thank you, Shireen. Sorry to make you come up here. Uh, okay, so next on the agenda, we are going to review and discuss the seventh progress report. And I think, Beth, you're going to lead that discussion. Okay. And are we going to try to pull it up? Is it just so people can, yep, Bill can see it? Pull okay. it up. Yep, Bill can pull it up. Thank you, Bill. Great. Um, I'm really excited about the quality of the report this year. As Shireen mentioned, we had a record number of reporters. And I want to give a shout out to Shireen. I have to see her face. There we go. A shout out to Shireen and the reporting subcommittee members. Um, for doing such a terrific job making sure the form is something that people understand. If you don't ask the questions right, then you don't get the right answers and you can't track year to year. So it's always a challenge to make sure we're tracking the same information year to year, um, but making it as clear as possible and enhancing it every year. And the, that group really does a great job. And Shireen keeps everyone in order. So huzzah to Shireen. Um, we also, I'm proud to say, uh, cut down the report a bit, streamlined it a bit. Um, we cut it by about a third, maybe a little more than that, because there's a lot more white space. There's a lot of great images. Um, we moved some long-standing long content, like the benefits of sustainability, to the website. And I want to give a shout out to you know the terrific web people um, at OGS, Jen Warner and Jeff Knack, who were so open to moving content to the website itself so that we can streamline the way the report works so that the report is focused more on new information and not just bringing uh, around older information. Um, we also created a new fact sheet on all the different state initiatives that support climate and sustainability. And we have been working very closely um, with the folks who do one, EO 166 and EO 88 to harmonize the reporting for next year. It's been a big job that Shireen's been working on and to do more integrated work together to help <coughs> the agencies do what they need to do on sustainability and climate. Um, also, we have moved like the already reported projects and case studies to case study fact sheets and more information on the website. So we're highlighting the you know, different projects that we really liked and putting more detail there. And I, you know, a lot of folks that are in the room today contributed to those, and I really appreciate that. Heather did one, so she's sitting right next to me. I'll give her a kudos for that. Um, and then I have to give my, my usual annual thanks to the writing and editing team, you know, many of whom are here. Some sit on the committee. You know, Darren, he always helps me wrap up the whole thing, letter from the commissioners, the executive summary, the paper use sections. Christina DeNovo works on the promise for sustainability. And when I say your name, you should at least rise. Rise, Christina. There you go. Um, and this year, she also worked on pest management, but this year she was our image editor. And I think that the quality of the images, you can tell, has really upped their game. And we always have to wrestle high density, you know, high resolution pictures out of folks. And I just love what we've got this year. Um, Jody Smith-Sanderson, who couldn't be here from DASNY, but she works on people planning and money with me every year. We have a new team member, Nasiba, El Nasiba Elmi, from uh, Materials Management at DEC, who edited Waste Reduction, Recycling, and Composting and wrote the new section on special waste. And she was helped um, by Shuvia Arakali, who wrote from NIPA, who wrote the Waste Reduction section. Thank you very much for that, uh, Carrie Jane. And Gary Feinland uh, from DEC, who does the numbers and the data for waste. Every time you gather quantitative data, you have to make sure the data is accurate. And so there's um, a process we call data cleansing that a staff person has to look at the information. They have to see what the numbers were last year. If there's a big jump, it's kind of like when you're a credit card and you've, you've gone someplace like 
you know, Uzbekistan, but you've never been there before and you've spent a lot, you're like, oh, is that really how much paper you reported? For example, I won't name names, but one regional office reported uh, purchasing more copy paper than the entire agency had purchased in a whole year. So we thought, okay, there's a problem there. So you have to do that kind of thing because people make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. And so they are really the unsung heroes of this report, the, the folks that have to work on the quantitative data. So thanks to Gary. Chloe Whitaker was the other person who worked on cl cleansing the data for the paper use um, section. And I know that Darren really appreciated everything she did. Connor Shea, Connor, uh, wrote glean green cleaning and water conservation this year. Heather Saunders wrote energy efficiency. She's sitting up here, so we won't make her rise. Um, Brandon Woodruff, who you've heard from already, he's our one co-chair, does a great job. He wrote Green Transportation. He also helped me troubleshoot a lot of the operations challenges issues when we discussed those, um, all while planning the Green Your Commute Day event and keeping up a really lively correspondence with our agency sustainability coordinators and teams on SharePoint. SharePoint is my new best friend. We did the report on SharePoint this year, which reminds me that one of the other things that Christina did is she is our SharePoint guru. And believe me, you need one of those when you're working like that with a lot of people on one document. Marna Pazluzny, um, DEC's own uh, co-sustainability coordinator, helped write the green infrastructure section. And Todd Gardner um, wrote most of Buying Green. And Todd is the director, Todd, Todd, you have to rise, the director of the green procurement team at OGS. And Todd does a lot of terrific work all the time, and it's summarized in the Buying Green section, so I highly recommend that you look at it. And last but not least, my intern, Melissa Calabria from Siena, could not be here today, but she wrote the Restricting the Use of Bottled Water sections. She summarized all the savings and cost information, and she helped compile it and edit it, and I'm really grateful to Melissa, so thank you, Melissa. And a lot of the folks I just spoke about also helped with these new fact sheets we're doing, um, with gathering the images from the projects that we wanted. Did I forget Emily? Oh, Emily. My goodness me, I did. Emily Dominiak, rise, Emily, rise, <laughs> who edited, she edited all the water and the green infrastructure and sustainable landscaping sections, and she wrote the sustainable landscaping sketches. So thank you, Emily. I can't believe that I would leave you out. Did I leave, oh, I left out someone else. Mike Wise and Caitlin Tremblay from Parks, who did the renewable energy section. There's a lot of data there. Renewable energy is this really challenging and evolving area. VEDER, anyone? Anyone want to talk about what VEDER means? I had to learn what that meant. So um, I really appreciate that from Parks. And Parks does a lot of great work on renewable energy. So there you go. All my thanks. They would have, they would have pulled me off the stage already at the Oscars. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's a great team. It's a pleasure to work with all of you, and I am so grateful to everyone. So on to the highlights of the report. Um, I'll just sort of hit some of the, of the most important things. Um, overall, copy paper purchasing has decreased 53% since fiscal year 0809, saving the state $29.2 million in the first seven years of the Cuomo administration. And it is summarized on that first page that has Roanne's picture on it. Bill, if you want to go back there. Um, okay. 55.4 million since reporting began, and that's it, and $8 million roughly a year. Executive agencies have virtually eliminated the purchase of bottled water, and 80% of authorities who are not required under Executive Order 18 to eliminate the purchase of bottled water have also eliminated or restricted bottled water purchases um, to very limited uses, like soldiers in the field or uh, detainees being transported by bus. The purchase of 100% post-consumer recycled content processed chlorine-free chlorine -free copy paper has doubled since 2009-10, from 22% to 46% of all copy paper purchased in 1718. The recycling rate for 1718 is 70% compared to 50% first measured in 0809, and the number of agencies composting has more than doubled since fiscal year 12-13. The Green Purchasing Program, run by Todd Gardner, I went I mentioned one once again, won two national awards in 2017 and 2018, one from the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council and one from the EPEAT folks whose name is escaping me, the actual name of their organization. New York State, um, we, we were able to track, and I think we could 
we could track even more if our tracking system is better, and we're working on improving our tracking system, but we spent $106.8 million on green products in 1718. We generated 9 million kilowatt hours of solar energy in 1718 for our own agency use, and that was more than triple the previous year. And under Todd's leadership, um, we issued a new solar power purchase agreement contract, and four mini bids were released by state agencies under that contract in 1718, and they have the potential to more than quadruple agency solar output um, by 56 million kilowatt hours a year. So there are a lot of great things going on. I won't talk about every you know thing else that we track, but just a few highlights. You know, 90% of agencies use electronic means to provide documents to the public all or majority of the time, and 82% use electronic means to receive documents. That's one of the reasons why we've been able to cut paper use. 94% um, set weather appropriate building temperature control ranges to conserve energy at all or a majority of their facilities. 80% um, uh, including those in lease spaces not directly responsible for, green cl for cleaning use green cleaning pro products all or a majority of the time. And 44% of agencies use non-chemical means of pest control um, at, on turf and ornamentals at all or a majority of their facilities. So there's a lot of exciting things going on in that area. If you want to scroll down, Bill, to the savings tables, there, scroll, you know, go past there to the savings. Keep going, keep going. It's right here. So one of the things we do every year is we ask agencies, are they saving money? breaking even or spending money on different sustainable activities. And what we've found over the years, this is now a compilation of nine years of data, um, that reducing energy, uh, restricting the purchase of bottled water, and reducing waste have a very high level of savings associated with them. And as you can see, a very small number of you know, agencies, sometimes it's only one or two, say that those things cost them money. All the rest of the activities that are down below, and if you can scroll up just a tiny bit, Bill, so we can see those headings. No, I mean I mean down, sorry. There we go. So things like water conservation and recycling and composting, green transportation, they all, for the most part, just break even. And they can have savings associated with them. Usually the savings are more than any identified costs. The ones with a higher um, level of cost, which is still very low, 12% uh, is the highest we have of anyone saying that it costs more are purchasing in renewable energy. I think that's because, one, renewable energy can cost a lot up front. In the long run, it saves you money, but up front, it can cost you something. So I think right now that we're doing all these projects at the beginning, I think it feels like we're spending money. Um, that actual estimate went down from the year before about how many thought they were spending mon money. And then green purchasing, because you're buying something, I think you're aware that you're, you're using money to do that. And some things like a green vehicle, for example, can cost a little more up front. It's going to save you money in the long run. But generally speaking, the, the answers that say they're saving money or breaking even are definitely way beyond the people who say that they're spending money. So because we have our colleague from the Division of Budget here, what we'd like to assure you is that sustainability really does not spend, you know, cost money over time. It can cost money up front, though. And so it's good to have a little bit of a, of a seed fund or something like that to get it going. But once you've got that going and you can keep rolling that over, then the projects begin to save money or not spend any more money. You know, To do green cleaning, you don't have to spend more money on the products, but you might have to spend money on training, for example. So that's what we found. So I wanted to highlight that, the spendings piece here today. Um, and then finally, last but not least, some highlights of cases. If you go down a little bit to the picture of the cat, Bill. There we go. Um, I love the cat picture, for one, and Brendan was just down there, so we highlighted this because it's a great story. The Javits Center has virtually eliminated the use of rodenticides by using and employing um, these volunteer cats that come into their area, the loading docks, and they are spayed and neutered using local organizations. Um, they are no longer strays, they are fed, they are housed, they are even given treats, they are sometimes adopted. And I think they only had about four of them when one of the stories I saw, but they do not have to use rodenticides anymore. And when I spoke to our fish and wildlife folks who are generally concerned about um, feral cat populations that can kill birds, these are not feral cats at all anymore. 
And one of the problems that we've been having, um, our fish and wildlife people in New York, is that raptors are being poisoned by eating mice that have taken rodenticides. And so by eliminating the use of rodenticides, we are also protecting birds. So it's a great project at the Javits Center. Some other highlights from this page. SUNY um, ESF created a green revolving fund for sustainability projects, something that we're encouraging more agencies to do to set up some kind of small dedicated fund um, for both um, non-personal service and uh, capital projects. This project at ESF is for capital. SUNY Oneonta donated five point uh, two five tons of reusable items to more than 200 members of the community at the end of the school year. And these are great community projects that a lot of, of universities are doing now. When they do the clean outs, they're not just throwing everything away, they're giving it away. It's fabulous. The Office of Mental Health adopted a terrific nutritional menu database that helps forecast um, inventory needs based on the dietary needs, and it has helped them significantly reduce um, the amount of food they use. Um, and they worked with NIPA. The Office of Mental Health did a lot of projects this year, and they worked with NIPA to do an energy efficiency project, and they expect more than $545,000 in savings from that. Energy efficiency is very cost effective. The Battery Park City Authority partnered with City Bike, and that was our photo on the cover of the report, to give staff an emissions-free way to get around the grounds. And they also partnered with Grow New York City to compost 6,000 pounds of locally generated food scraps from local businesses. So they're composting right on site there at Battery Park. The Environmental Facilities Corporation, our colleague here on the committee, decreased their vehicle miles traveled by 28% this year, achieving a five-year reduction goal, I mean total of 64% reduction, which is incredible. And I was asking um, Brian earlier how they do that, and it's really just a lot of networking and, and coordination, but it's terrific. Um, and then NIPA, I want to call out NIPA. NIPA did a lot of great things this year, but one of the things that we highlighted was working with the Electric Utility Industry Supply Chain Alliance, and they adopted a new supplier survey that has metrics and targets and criteria in it to be integrated into their RFP process. And I can't highlight enough how important it is to take all of the sustainability things we're trying to do and drive them into these documents that are what we use to do business every day. Leases, contracts, RFPs. So that's just a great project, you know, Carrie Jane. Awesome. Um, and I think that's it for me for my summary. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Beth. Uh, does anybody on the committee have any questions or any comments before we take a vote? All right. Anybody from the public want to make a comment or anything on the report? All right. So uh, we are now going to have a vote on basically approving uh, for uh, publication and posting to the uh, OGS Green New York website, a final version of the seventh progress report. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great, thank you. And so this report is approved. Now the next on the agenda, we will move into uh, a review of previously tentatively approved specifications that we are going to move for final approval. And before you do that, yes. I have two more thank yous. I know this is uh, incredible, okay. but um, one, John Vanna. So John Vanna, rise. John, you have to stand. Stand. John Vanna, who is the director of the Pollution Prevention Unit at DUC. His staff worked tirelessly on sustainability, agency sustainability, and green procurement. Um, I want to give John a special thanks. Not only did he shepherd a number of these projects from the beginning, but he took over some work for me this year and managed everybody's work. So I really appreciate it, John. Thank you. Um, and then our newest staff member um, in the Pollution Prevention Unit, Kelly Jones. Kelly, rise. Kelly came in um, this spring and really helped clean up some of the last you know, uh, specs, <coughs> respond to comments, and do that. So thank you very much, Kelly. And then other folks have already been recognized, so I will stop. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, again, we're going to now move into a review of specifications. These uh, first set are the specifications that were 
voted on by this committee uh, for ten tentatively approving them. They were posted for public comment. Uh, there were only two that did not receive comment. So um, as you guys probably remember, uh, the rules of this committee, if a uh, tentatively approved specification does not receive any comments, uh, any substantive comments in 90 days uh, following the uh, notice that's put into uh, the New York State Register and the Environmental Notice Bulletin, then it becomes final. Um, the, so there were only two of those that have become final. Uh, I believe it was brake pads and reusable bags. Uh, the rest of these were tentatively approved and did receive comments. So this year uh, we posted um, along with the specification uh, on the website that announces this meeting, we posted all the specifications as well as a background slash response to comments document to go along with the specification. Um, we had offline discussions with uh, at least one of the entities that made a significant amount of comments. And uh, yeah, so with that, we'll move into the first one. How we'll do it is I'll ask uh, Todd to come up and just go through the spec. Um, remember, we have a limited amount of time, so. We're doing really well in time, Darren, even well, with all my Well, we're still limited. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Todd, take it away on imaging equipment. Uh, thanks, Darren. <clears throat> so in April of last year, a tentative spec for imaging equipment was released by the inter interagency subcommittee for comments. Uh, and comments were received from the Healthy Schools Network and the American Chemistry Council's North American Flame Retardant Alliance. After reviewing the comments, um, we made a change to the specification. We added an encouragement to purchase products that meet EPEAT optional criteria 4.1.4.1, reduction of substances on the EU REACH candidate list of HVHCs in order to provide purchasers with a lead-free option um, and this was added as an encouragement and not a requirement due to concerns over product availability. We didn't make any changes to the disclosure of flame retardant language at the end of this section because it's an encouragement for bidders uh, to disclose the flame retardants used in the products offered and to offer products that meet flame retardancy standards uh, that don't have added flame retardants. And so because it doesn't ban or prohibit um, flame retardants or products that contain those flame retardants, um, we didn't feel like we needed to make any changes. And so based on the minor uh, nature of the changes, the recommendation is to um, that the revised tentative specification be advanced to the committee as a final spec. All right, great. Uh, does anybody on the committee have any questions for Todd? Todd, hold on a sec. I have, I have a question. Do you guys work with ITS on the specs for this type of equipment? Do we... Um, Do you take comments from ITS? Have you ever spoken to them? You, are they part of any committees or...? Um, no, I don't, I don't believe ITS is part of the committee. However, in the future... Yeah, that's a good idea. Yep. I mean, the, the specs do get circulated for, you know, a lot of these specs, uh, I know, go to Department of Health and get feedback and, uh, you know, so they do get circulated to agencies that might have some expertise where DEC might not be the, you know, the biggest expert on that field. Um, and in the future, if there's anything that affects technology, no, we'll good. certainly reach out to ITS. Thank you, Sandra. That's a good okay. suggestion. We'll tell them that you volunteered them. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Budget carries the weight. So, and they would uh, still have a chance to comment because it's a tentative spec at this point anyway. Well, okay. no, not no, really. No, this is no, final. This is for final. Oh, this is final. <laughs> we have another one that's coming up. That's okay. yeah. Right. So anyone in the audience want to go to the podium and make a comment? Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Todd. And so with that, we will take a vote to, uh, on final approval for imaging equipment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? 
Thanks very much. Imaging equipment passes. The next spec on the agenda is janitorial paper products, and John Vanna from DEC will explain. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Kelly Jones. Um, I have several of these on the agenda, and she was extremely helpful with um, addressing the comments, looking into kind of revisions for the specs as well. So thank you, Kelly. Um, this is janitorial paper products. OK. Um, so this is one that was um, released as a new specification last April, approved by the, the um, interagency committee. <coughs> Excuse me. We got comments from three ent entities, Underwriters Laboratories, who um, is the entity that manages the EcoLogo um, certification programs. We also got comments from the American Chemistry Council and the American Forest and Paper Association. Um, we made several changes to the specification um, from when it was released in April to address the comments. Um, first, a couple. Um, Web links were updated um, per comments we got from UL EcoLogo, our underwriters laboratory. Um, UL EcoLogo also gave us some additional language um, for the standard settings and certification program section where we introduced um, them, um, and we adopted that, that language. Um, and then um, the final change that we made is in the the specification section, and this was in regards to comments we got from the American Forest and Paper Association. We got some comments from them that indicated they weren't entirely clear on what we were asking for in this particular provision. So what we did was we tried to make it as clear as we could that this is um, a process chlorine-free requirement and add a little bit more detail to that to address their comment. Um, we did get some additional comments from groups that we didn't um, address. Um, in the background section, we got some edits and commentary from both American Chemistry Council and the American Forest and Paper Associations, suggesting that we remove the words formaldehyde and heavy metals as um, things that are kind of usually, or, or in some instances, restricted by third-party certifications. We did not address that comment as we um, offered this as background information, and we think it's um, accurate to include formaldehyde and heavy metals as examples of the type of things that are restricted in third-party certifications. Um, those two groups, the American Chemistry Council and American Forest and Paper Association, also asked us to remove a um, sentence from the same provision that, that said the use of third-party certification can also simplify the identification, evaluation, and solicitation process for green products, and asked us to include the statement third-party certifications must apply a risk-based approach that assesses both hazard and exposure. Um, so we, again, we thought that the statement that we made was accurate, and um, we also didn't think that the statement on um, the, the third-party certification must apply risk-based approach is um, indicative of what the market is for third-party certifications now. For the most part, um, they're hazard-based approaches, so we didn't, we didn't feel that it was necessary to make that change either. And that is it for this. Um, and the recommendation from the procurement subcommittee meeting was, or procurement subcommittee was that the, for the interagency committee to adopt this as final. All right, thanks a lot, John. Uh, any questions from the committee members? Nope, okay. Uh, thank you very much, John. Does anybody from the public want to make a statement or comment? Thank you. My name is Margaret Gorman. I'm the Senior Director of the Northeast Region for the American Chemistry Council. Just generally, I'm sure you've heard, we have commented on several of the specs today. I want to thank the departments, both departments, for being open this year, answering a lot of our questions. Um, we've certainly had some offline discussions on questions that our panels have had and look forward to working with them throughout the next year. I know some are going to be tentative specs, so we certainly want to continue to serve as a resource for all of you. Um, just quickly on the janitorial paper from the formaldehyde perspective, I know um, it was suggested that, yes, we did have comments that um, 
the restriction part under page one background that um, the restrictions on the presence of certain toxic substances such as formaldehyde and heavy metals. I think the concern there was that it was just targeted as an example and yes, I'm sure there are others that can be used so we had just simply asked to just have those that removed. Um, but again, we look forward to working with all of you in the coming year on comments from our panels on the additional specs. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, so uh, I trust there are no others. Okay, so we will move for final approval. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so janitorial paper products is approved. The next on the agenda is the paint specification and Emily Dominiak will explain. The paint specification was released or tentatively approved last year um, and got three comments from the Healthy Schools Network, um, UL, and the American Coatings Association. And in response to those comments, we made several changes, um, first of which, as John mentioned on the janitorial paper spec, they, UL asked for the definitions of their standards to be altered, so we changed it to both align with what they asked and um, to align with what was listed in the other specifications so that they're uh, the same across the board. Um, and then the American Coatings Association asked that both Greenwise, Gold, and um, the Master Painters Institute Extreme Green certifications be removed um, based on, they claimed that um, they were not widely used and not developed in a consensus-based fashion. So we investigated that um, and determined that Greenwise Gold and the standard Greenwise certification um, were not developed in a consensus-based fashion, and so we've removed that standard. Um, but MPI Extreme Green has been vetted um, by the EPA and is on their list of recommended certifications for federal green purchasing. Um, so that one remained on the um, options for third-party certifications. Um, the next change, because of removing Greenwise, the hierarchy of strong versus um, acceptable third-party standards was no longer applicable, so we removed that hierarchy. Um, and then the comment from, um, the other comment from UL was to require Greenwise Gold, um, and we didn't do that because Greenwise Gold is a single attribute certification, but in that section where we list single attribute certifications, um, we added additional detail to explain what each of those um, attributes is looking at um, to, to show that Greenwise Gold only looks at VOCs. The only comment that we didn't make a change in response to was the Healthy Schools Networks ask to make lead ban lead as a requirement. Um, and we looked into that, and it looks like the paint market just isn't quite there yet. All of the um, required certifications on their list of chemicals of concern include lead as one of the, the chemicals that shouldn't be in products, but um, a flat out ban wasn't possible at this time. So um, seeing as none of these comments are substantial, even the removal of Greenwise Gold doesn't affect the market availability of products, um, we recommend that the specification is approved finally. All right, great. Thank you, Emily. Uh, does anybody, wait, hold on for a sec. Does anybody <laughs> on the committee have any questions for Emily? Okay, now you're free. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody in the audience want to make a statement or comment? Okay, so now we will have a vote uh, for final approval of the paint specification. And I forgot to mention earlier, I just wanna mention to everybody that we left this in kind of a red line format so folks on the committee and in the audience could see where any changes were made in response to the comments we received, but uh, those will all be accepted and a clean version will be posted after the meeting. So with that, um, all in favor of final approval of the paint specification, please say aye. 
Aye. Thank you. Uh, anyone opposed? All right. So the paint specification is approved. Next on the agenda is the pest management for outdoor spaces specification, and John Vanna will walk us through that. Okay, so this again was a specification that was um, approved tentative last April. Um, the difference with this one in, re in contrast to the one Emily presented and the other one I presented on janitorial paper, this um, was issued tentative last year and it was already um, an existing specification. So it was, re it was revised and issued again as a tentative specification. I offer that because what you'll see in this is a mess of comments. Um, what I did in this the comments that are not highlighted in yellow are comments that have already been accepted by the interagency committee. Those were comments that were already in the version that was adopted or, or released in April 2018. The ones I've highlighted in yellow in this sheet that you may have reviewed already are the um, changes we made to address new comments. Um, and what I'll highlight is the ones that are in yellow, which are the, the, the comments we got and the changes we made to address those comments. Um, so for the pest management for outdoor spaces, we got comments from the Healthy Schools Network, and we also got comments after we presented this to our procurement subcommittee from our colleagues at the New York State Department of Health that we also addressed. In response to those comments, um, the first thing that we changed, the Healthy Schools Network wanted us to be a little bit more proactive in offering some advice or assistance to folks on implementation, and they made a suggestion that we actually reference the Cornell integrated pest management program um, as a resource. The New York State funds that program, so I thought it was completely appropriate to reference that for state users of pest management for outdoor spaces. So we incorporated that um, provision or a statement on Cornell and using them as a resource into the appropriate section of the specification. Um, the rest of the commentary we got were just things that we clarified based on some comments we got from the Department of Health um, the first change that we made from DOH comments was that we, we added language that they suggested to make affected entities aware that the use of pesticides is prohibited on the grounds of schools and daycare centers in New York. Um, the second um, um, addition we made or, or revision we made based on DOH comments were that we added details, a little bit more of a definition um, to, their, to DOH's liking on what a biopesticide is. And we also added a reference directing readers of the spec to, uh, to a website that DEC hosts for, with a database where people can search for registered biopesticides to use. Um, and the final um, revision we made, again, based on a DOH comment, um, was language added to make affected entities aware that they must comply with all applicable pesticide notification requirements. Um, you know, that is it. As I said, um, you know, DOH did offer some comments after our procurement subcommittee, you know, um, gave us to go ahead to move this forward as a final spec to the interagency committee. We addressed all the DOH comments. Um, our recommendation is the interagency committee approve the spec. Thanks, John. Anyone on the committee have any questions for John? All right. Thanks a lot, John. Anyone in the public uh, wish to make a comment or statement? Okay, so we will take a vote for final approval for pest management for outdoor spaces. All in favor of final approval, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Great, thank you. Pest management for outdoor spaces is approved and John will stay up at the podium. The next specification is pest management for indoor spaces. Okay, so this is Sibler, um, intro to the other one. This is again, um, a spec that was released l last year. It was an existing spec, um, so it had revisions that were already made when it was released in April, so same thing here. Um, a lot of the strikeouts or previous changes that were made back in April of 2018, the new changes are highlighted in yellow. Um, same two entities commented on this one. We got comments from the Healthy Schools Network and New York State Department of Health. The Healthy Schools Network comment was, was similar to what it was in the, the outdoor space specification, asking us to add additional detail on implementation and to reference the Cornell IPM program. 
Um, we included that, again, in the appropriate section of the specification, a reference to Cornell's IPM program. Um, DOH gave us several comments. Some of them were very similar to the one you saw in the outdoor spaces. I'll just run through those real quickly. Um, so as suggested by DOT, we revised the specification to clarify, and this is one that was actually different from the, um, the outdoor space specification. DOH asked us to clarify that the, the, the specification um, that antimicrobial products must be registered by both DOH, DEC and DOH. So we re revised to clarify that. And we also added a um, link to the DEC database, which can also allow users to find information on antimicrobial products. Um, also, as suggested by DOH, similar to the outdoor um, specification, they asked us to provide additional details on what a biopesticide is. We did that. And we also added, uh, again, the DEC, the link to the DEC database that allows people to find um, biopesticide, registered biopesticide products. Similar, um, DOH also su asked, suggested that we add language to make affected entities aware that they must apply with all applicable pesticide notification requirements. We added a provision on that as well. And the final thing that they asked us to do, they asked, DOH asked us to clarify that this specification does not supersede existing requirements that need to be undertaken in certain situations um, for special disinfection and sanitation practices that are sometimes required under state regulation and law. And we added a statement um, similar to what we've used in other specifications to address that um, comment as well. Um, so again, same thing, the, the interagen or the procurement subcommittee meet group approved this change, suggested we move it on to the interagency committee for approval. DOH subsequently gave us some comments. We feel that we addressed all the DOH comments and the recommendation is that the interagency committee um, move the finalized the spec. All right, thanks. Uh, does anybody on the committee have any questions for John? I, I just have a note. I think it's important. We've we've um, talked with health a lot about this language. It's similar to the language we had in the disinfectant um, and sanitizer specification. I think it's important, though, that we also state here that it's recommended that affected entities prioritize green cleaning first. So even though we're recognizing that there's times when you need to use a disinfectant, we're saying don't. There's a, there's a lot of folks. It's just one of those things people do. They reach for a disinfectant when they really don't need it. So it's a balancing act in the language, but I think we did a nice job here of making sure that it's all stated, so. All right, great. Uh, does anybody from the audience want to make a statement or a comment on this specification? Okay, so we will take a vote. Uh, all in favor for final approval of the pest management for indoor spaces specification, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great, thank you. Thank you, John. And John will, again, stay at the podium for the next spec, which is prepackaged snow melt and de-icing products. Okay, so this, is a, this was a, um, approved tentatively last year in April. Um, we got comments from the American Chemistry Council and, and the New York State Chemistry Council. I will say that the comments were not identical, but they were very, very similar in their scope. Um, the comments generally question the value of the certification programs that we pointed to, referenced in the specification, um, encouraged us to include in information on the use of best management practices, and suggested that we you know, eliminate the specification as written if we didn't make changes to it. Um, in response to those comments, we did make some changes. Um, in the standard setting and certification program section, where we referenced the Pacific Northwest Snow Fighters, Association. This is one of the certification programs that we utilize in the specification. To address what we think is the value of, of these certification programs, we added a little bit more language in there as to what you know types of things the um, the PNS certification program actually requires a product to meet. We do think it's of value. We think the um, Safer Choice program by EPA is also similarly of value. Um, and in addition to that, to address the comments on best management practices, in the specification state section, we added a paragraph requiring entities to follow best management practices provided by the manufacturers um, to ensure that de-icing products are not used in lieu of snow removal and to ensure that snow pile locations limit the refreezing of snow melt, because we certainly agreed with the notion of 
um, you know, limiting the use of any of these products is a good thing, and we think best manager practices should be, you know, followed in that respect. Um, and, and that is it for this one. Um, the procurement subcommittee, you know, um, suggested this move forward as a final specification. Thank you. Does anybody on the committee have any questions for John? Would anybody uh, in the audience like to make a statement or comment on this spec? All right, so we'll have a vote all in favor of final approval of the prepackaged snowmelt and de-icing products specification. Please say aye. 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 Thank you. Anyone opposed? Great, the prepackaged snowmelt and de-icing products specification is approved. Next is the state-funded lodging specification, and Brendan Woodruff of DEC will explain that one. I don't have any props for this one. Uh, I suppose one of the probably tens of hotel room keys I've accidentally taken uh, <laughs> would do, but I don't have one in my wallet today. Um, so for the state-funded lodging, we received one comment on this. I uh, raised general comments about Audubon International's Green Lodging Program. Uh, if you scroll down, you can see where we've added it there. Um, but it didn't uh, include any specifics about the new standard itself. Um, for the Audubon program, we went through and did another analysis of it, and um, we saw that it does meet all of the criteria that we've set for a robust lodging certification program. It has strong entry criteria. It has third-party verification of commitments. It has a requirement for continuous improvement, and it requires uh, that entities communicate their sustainability commitment to their employees and the public. So um, with that, uh, we recommend uh, finalizing the tentative, uh, tentatively approved specification as is great um, so Brendan this basically is an encouragement uh, specification is that correct correct yeah yep. okay so just so the committee members are aware uh, does any do any committee members have any other questions for Brendan all right would anybody in the public like to make a comment or statement okay thank you Brendan we'll have a vote all in favor of final approval of the state-funded lodging specification, please say aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. Anyone opposed? Great. The state-funded lodging spec is approved. Uh, last for uh, review for final approval is the trash bags specification, and John Vanna will come on back up to the podium. <laughs> Okay, this is it for me. <laughs> okay, so trash bags. Again, um, uh, interagency committee moved this forward as a tentative specification last April. Um, the only comments we got were from Underwriters Laboratory, which again is the entity that operates the Eco Logo certification program. Um, in response to these comments, we made a couple changes. Um, the first changes were very simple, just updating um, web links in this in the specification on pages two and five. We corrected the web links per Ecologo's suggestion. Um, in addition, similar to some of the other specifications that you heard about, uh, UL Ecologo also provided us some suggested language for how they wanted themselves defined in our standard setting and certification program section. So again, we revised the the UL Ecologo language to. Um, to address um, the, the language that they provided to us. We did get one, one suggestion from UL Ecologo that we did not address. Um, it wasn't entirely clear to us where they were coming from us on the, specific, on the comment, but they made a recommendation to us that the UL Ecologo 126 certification program should be included in the specification as strong or a preferred certification. Again, we did not make changes to reflect this um, the reference to UL Eco Logo 126 in the specification, it merely encourages the procurement of products where recycled content and environmental and health attributes have been verified by an independent entity. In that respect, we use UL Eco Logo 126 as an example of the type of specification that you could a purchaser could could look to in that situation. Um, again, since it was just an encouragement, we weren't contemplating any parsing of strong or or um, preferred um, you know differentiation between the between the specifications we, we thought that the 
the inclusion of UL Eco Logo 126 and the other examples we provided in this paragraph were sufficient. Um, so again, the procurement subcommittee um, reviewed the changes that were made to this and, and um, suggests that the interagency committee ad adopt this specification as final. All right. Uh, does anybody on the committee have any questions for John? <clears throat> All right. Thank you, John. Anybody in the audience have any, uh, want to make a statement or a comment? Okay. So we'll call for a vote on the, for final approval of the trash bag specification. All in favor of final approval, please say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? Thank you very much. The trash bag specification is approved. And now we will move into the next uh, section of the agenda, which is review of some new and some amended specifications for tentative approval. Uh, first on that list is a new one, computers and displays. Todd Gardner of OGS will explain. Thanks, Darren. So um, this is a new revised specification for desktop and laptop computers. Um, in 2018, EPEAT updated their standard for computers and displays in order to increase focus on priority and impact areas, such as climate change, chemicals, resources, and consumption. And as a result, uh, the existing EO4 specification for desktop and laptop computers needed to be revised to make it consistent with the new EPEAT standards. Um, while reviewing the new standards, we reached out to EPEAT uh, for assistance in determining how um, our old specification requirements matched up with the new criteria. And it was found that we could uh, match our existing specifications by requiring EP bronze and optional criteria 4.1.2.1, restriction of the use of cadmium uh, under the new standards. And um, in addition, in order to provide purchasers such as schools with a lead-free option, um, we added um, an encouragement to the specification to purchase products that meet EPEAT optional criteria 4.1.6.2, reduction of substances on the EU REACH candidate list of HVHCs. And this criteria was added as a recommendation rather than a requirement due to concerns over product availability. So I'm just gonna run through the changes to the existing spec, which is we changed the title to match the title of the EPEAT category. We revised the list of covered products to match the covered products that are contained in the EP category. Um, we added or revised definitions for the covered products to match the definitions used in IEEE 1680.1. We revised the specification section to require EP bronze plus optional criteria 4.1.2.1, which would match the criteria uh, under the old standards and we added optional criteria 4.1.6.2 uh, as an encouragement to provide an option for a lead-free product. Um, and then the last change was we added our model packaging language. Um, so that's a summary of the, the changes to the existing spec. All right, great. Uh, does anyone on the committee have any questions for Todd? I guess I would just ask that you reach out to ITS for their comments. Yeah, we, we, we will do that. Um, just to clarify, we do work with our, our group within procurement services that works on the IT contracts to make sure that there's like good product availability and we won't impact our contracts. But we, we can specifically reach out to the, to the, the agency, ITS. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and in the report also, we've got a great table that um, that Todd came up. But we've been we've been requiring this really strong, the strongest standard in the country for computers for at least ten years. Is before we even began doing the EO4 um, process, and it's been fabulous. We've saved money. Um, we've been because we do an aggregate purchase when we purchase. 
some things. We've been purchasing a little less computers in in the past couple years than in the very beginning, but we almost we save almost as much as we spend um, off the actual contract price because of the aggregate buys. So what we say about this particular specification and standard in our aggregate purchasing program is that even though the green attributes aren't driving the lower price, the it's not at all affecting how much savings we're getting. So just to reassure you, and ITS, of course, has been very knowledgeable about the fact that we're buying these computers for the last 10 years, so it's not a huge change. But we will. It's a good, a good, a good recommendation. Right, absolutely. So after, uh, if these uh, specifications are voted on and approved, they will be posted for public comment, uh, like I said before, and uh, um, for the notice will go in the New York State Register and the Environmental Notice Bulletin that they have been posted. Um, and so for at least 90 days after that, the, whatever date is the latest of the notice provisions, uh, they'll stay up, and in fact, they pretty much stay up until for a year until the next meeting as a matter of practice. So, so with that, would uh, anybody in the public, uh, in the audience, like to make a comment or statement on this spec? All right, I will call for a vote to tentatively approve and post for public comment the computers and displays specification. So all in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. Uh, is anyone opposed? Great, thank you, and thank you, Todd. That is the, that specification is tentatively approved. Uh, next is the adhesive specification. Todd's gonna stay at the podium. Uh, this was tentatively approved uh, a year ago, and because of some substantial changes, uh, it's being reintroduced for tentative approval. Um, so take it away, Todd. Uh, yes, so we received uh, comments on the tentative spec from uh, the Adhesives and Sealants Council, the American Chemistry Council, the American Coatings Association, Clean and Healthy New York, the Healthy Schools Network, Momentive, and UL. And uh, so uh, after reviewing the comments, we made a few revisions to the spec. We um, added goal and background sections um, which was suggested, uh, I believe, by Clean and Healthy New York, and we did that to provide more information uh, on the reason for the development of the spec, and information on the types of chemicals that are contained in adhesives was moved to this section from the specification section, where I think we thought it felt a little better. Um, also, within the background section, um, the use of disocyanates and formaldehyde as examples of asthmogens was not changed. Um, I believe that was a comment from the American Chemistry Council because they, um, they are listed in the AOEC database and they are examples of asthmogens, so we felt that their use was appropriate here. Um, we added definitions for environmental product declaration and health product declaration statements in order to support the addition of those as an encouragement. We um, modified the definitions for UL Echo Logo and UL Green Guard Gold, which was a comment that we received uh, from UL. And we revised and reorganized the specification section. We added a hierarchy of attachment methods. We added a hierarchy of the certification standards to encourage multi-attribute certifications more than single attribute. We added an encouragement to use products that have an EPD, HPD, or equivalent. And throughout this section, we, we changed the word must to should to make it clear that all of the specification requirements are encouragements. Um, and then finally, the use of hazard lists such as Prop 65 in the AOEC database uh, were not removed from the spec because the use of those lists is an encouragement and it's not a prohibition or a ban. And we felt that the lists are an easy way to uh, screen products, and it allows the specification to include single attribute certifications that don't screen for material hazards. So based on those changes, we felt like uh, the spec should be re-released as tentative for another round of comments. All right, great, thanks, Todd. 
Uh, any members of the committee have any questions for Todd? All right, anyone in the audience want to make a statement? Good afternoon, I'm Bobby Wilding, Deputy Director of Clean and Healthy New York, and I just really wanted to thank you for the work that you put in to uh, improve this specification. Uh, we strongly support the use of the AOEC list to make sure that asthmogens are recognized, as particularly in applications like this, um, and we, we look forward to diving into the revisions further, but really appreciate the work that you put into it this year. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so with that, we will have a vote to tentatively approve the adhesive specification uh, for posting for public comment. All in favor of tentative approval of this specification, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And is anyone opposed? All right. So adhesive specification is tentatively approved. The next specification is the lubricants specification, and Todd will walk us through that too. Okay, um, so uh, we received comments on this specification from the American Chemistry Council. And um, after reviewing the comments, we made some changes to the spec. We added a background section to provide more information on the reason for the development of the spec uh, and to provide information on the types of chemicals that are contained in it. We moved uh, that information from the specification section to the background section. Um, within the background section, we added additional information regarding the health concerns related to fluorinated nonstick compounds. We um, added a definition for perfluorinated chemicals. We added definitions for environmental product declaration statements and health product declaration statements to support their use later as an encouragement. Um, and then in the specification section, we reorganized it um, to, to organize the certification standards into a hierarchy so that multi-attribute certifications are encouraged more than single attribute. We added an encouragement to use products that have an EPD or HPD. And throughout the section, we changed the word must to should to make it clear that all of, this, all of the specification um, specifications are encouragements and not requirements. Um, some of the things that we didn't change was uh, we did not remove formaldehyde as an example of an asthmogen because it's listed in the AOC database and it, it, it's an example of an asthmogen, so its use was appropriate. Um, we did not make changes uh, to the encouragement that the product should not contain fluorinated nonstick compounds. However, we did change the word shall not to should not to make it clear that it's an encouragement. And we did not remove the use of the hazard list, such as Prop 65 or the AOEC database, because we feel that the use of those lists is an encouragement, and it's not a prohibition or ban, and it's an easy tool to screen products. Uh, and it allows the use of single attribute certifications that don't screen for material hazards. So based on the changes, we feel that the, the specification should be re-released as tentative. All right, do any members have any questions for Todd? Okay, thank you, Todd. Does anybody in the audience wanna make a statement on this specification? All right, so we will have a vote on tentative approval and posting for public comment for the lubricant specification. All in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Is anyone opposed? All right. The lubricant specification is tentatively approved. And the last specification on the agenda is the floor coverings specification. Uh, Christina DeNovo will walk us through that. Okay, so the floor covering specification was released as a tentative, 
Tentatively approved specification by the interagency committee last year. Comments on the specification were received throughout uh, 2018. The specification was amended further throughout late 2018 and early 2019 due to comments received, conversations we've had with industry and representatives and, and interested NGOs, and further research done on our part. The amendments to the second amended part of the specification appear in purple, whereas the first part is in red. Uh, we received comments from Healthy Schools Network, Clean and Healthy New York, the Carpet and Rug Institute, the American Chemistry Council, the Floral Council, the Vinyl Institute, the National Science Foundation, the Resilient Floor Covering Institute, Underwriters Laboratories, um, Tarket, the Dixie Group, DBA Baslin, Maslin Contract, Mohawk, Interface, and Shaw. So just go through um, some of the amendments that were made this time around in the procurement section, which is part one. The section was amendment, amended to address the need to lay out more granular sourcing encouragements for different types of flooring. Since this is not cut and dry, based on material or flooring types alone, it was important to include information on material sourcing, issues associated with some types of recycled content, and the important, importance of recycling, or I'm sorry, recognizing that categories of flooring types can often rely on newer proprietary technologies. We included a wider, wider array of floor surfaces that people walk on, including carpeting and carpet padding, wood flooring, laminate, hard flooring, resilient flooring, and seamless poly polymer. And this was um, a comment from Healthy Schools Network. They, would like, they wanted us to do this. Um, it is also important to note that certified wood-based flooring ranks high on the list, not only due to its uh, low global warming impact, but also because of the carbon offsetting attributed to tree growth. It is recommended by a DEC Article 7 bill entitled Empire Force for the Future that the state purchase more sustainable wood-based products. We updated the definition section as well to add more definitions. <clears throat> Uh, this includes an updated definition of PVC to update its description of the manufacturing process associated with PVC. It was important to update this definition specifically because most PVC is no longer manufactured with added phthalates as a plasticizer. Other new definitions include semi-volatile organic compounds, since many of these can be present in carpet and floor coatings. It was important to distinguish these from VOCs because they tend to diminish over time, whereas SVOC emissions t can increase over time, especially with heavy foot traffic. <clears throat> Other definitions that were added are the Prop 65 list, PFCs, antimicrobials, and orthothalates. As these chemical groups were called out later in the spec, and it was requested by many of our NGOs that we define them as well. It was also request, requested that we define the Association of Occupa Occupational and Environmental Clinics, AOEC, <clears throat> specifically because they are a nonprofit resource database on asthmogens. Finally, we added a definition for floor coverings itself, and this helps to delineate hard flooring, resilient flooring, carpet tiles, and broadloom carpet. Some of the amendments to part two under all floor coverings are the section was updated to allow for an additional certifying program, which is called the Living Building Challenge. Floor coverings must now be certified by either the Living Building Challenge Declare label or Cradle to Cradle at the silver level or greater. If they are not certified by either body, they must have a health product declaration and an environmental product declaration. They must also be certified as low emitting under either UL Green Guard Gold, CRI Green Label Plus, or the SCS Floor Score Standard. We felt that this reworking would give manufacturers additional options while still ensuring they meet our environmental and health standards. Other minor additions include, we added a sentence, <clears throat> 
for all floor covers as an encouragement that they contain no intentionally added chemicals listed on the state's Calif state of California's Prop 65 list. We also added a sentence for carpet specifically that they contain no polyurethane backing, which results in a further lack of recycling options for carpet. <clears throat> We also added that carpet be made of nylon rather than wool because it has less of a climate change impact. Uh, flooring made of plant-based materials has a significantly lower glo global warming potential and a lower environmental impact than any other option. Also a note on carpet being low on the hierarchy on the preferred flooring spectrum. Carpet has the most global warming impact and global warming potential and the largest environmental impact of any other flooring product on the market. There are is issues associated with asthmogens due to the chemicals found in carpeting as well as SVOCs and dust that can enter the air. We are unable to determine if an entity will perform proper, proper maintenance of carpet or any flooring for that matter as requested by the manufacturer which can potentially reduce the levels of asthmogens. While carpet manufacturers may sometimes have take back programs, there are few and there are no <coughs> governmental programs for carpet recycling here in New York. The pro per the Product Stewardship Council, carpet is often very difficult to recycle as there are limited recycling outlets countrywide and there are many issues associated with the carpet stewardship program in California. Since carpet contains many different components, it is debatable as to which type of carpet is easiest and most cost effective to recycle. CARE, which is Carpet America Recovery Effort, has many, has had many non-compliance issues in the last few years and they're falling short of recycling goals. Carpet in landfills has been shown to take up a lot of space, degrade slowly over time, and leach persistent and sometimes bioaccumulative chemicals into landfill leachate. Carpet has a lifespan of only about 11 to 15 years making one of the least durable flooring materials, especially in commercial applications where it's often overlaid directly on concrete subfloor and glued as opposed to backed with a carpet pad, which can increase its lifespan, but would also contribute to more materials being used at its source. And that, that is going out as tentative again this year per your approval. Thank you. Hold on a sec. <clears throat> Excuse me, do any members have any questions uh, for Christina about this spec? No, thank you. I just have, I have a brief statement of thanks because one, um, Christina and I had a long discussion about how to track the different changes and it's not that easy to keep track of what the old changes were versus the new changes. I think John's yellow highlighting might be a good solution, but anyway, thank you for that, Christina, but also, I think that Christina's presentation just highlights it, how much work this spec has been and how important it is to really go into the weeds. And I'm so proud of the work that we all do on the Green Procurement Program and these specs, but I think that this particular one is just a great example of how much work it takes and really being open to these different comments and, and balancing all these different interests. So thank you so much, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, no doubt. Uh, would anybody in the audience like to make a statement or comment on this specification? All right, so we will have our last vote to tentatively approve the floor covering specification and post it for public comment. All members uh, in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? Great, so the floor covering specification is tentatively approved. And with that, Beth, do you have any final comments? Yes, yeah, oh. I have a few final All right. things. So um, one, just to finish up on, on specifications, um, I wanted to note that uh, in the report this year, we say we had 53 uh, approved specifications covering approximately 94 commodities, services, and technologies, and now with the passage of the ones we've done today, we are definitely at 61 approved specifications and we've broken the 100 barrier. So we're over 100 products covered. Um, we've done a lot of great work and I'm very proud of that work. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are open and very encouraging of folks to work with us on 
new ideas they might have for us to develop specifications and contracting. You know, the, the um, members of the interagency committee are open to meeting with people when they ask that. A um, couple of things that we are planning to work on this year, one is firefighting foam. We're concerned about the short chain PFAs and some of the problems we've had with uh, the perfluorinated substances, the long chain PFOS, um, contaminating uh, drinking water in Newburgh and other communities in New York State. And so we're planning to work with uh, the Department of Homeland Security on some um, guidelines for effective, safe alternatives to uh, firefighting foams containing short chain um, perfluorinated chemicals. Another issue we're planning to work on is um, paint and graffiti removers. There's a problem with methylene chloride. It's been banned um, in retail sales at the federal level this year, but commercial uses are still available, and we're thinking of asking our agencies to restrict the use of that. It's a very highly, acutely toxic substance. So those are some of the ideas for next year, and we welcome um, new ideas from folks and they can contact us through the OGS website email, and they can contact myself or Darren as well. Um, and I think that's it for today. Just thanks to everyone on the committee for being here and being present as we go through these very detailed and very important issues. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, I want to definitely uh, reiterate thank you to uh, the interagency committee members for taking time out and coming down for this meeting. I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.